I'm a permaculture designer and consultant. I live in Seattle. And I work on all kinds of projects helping clients um, assess the potential of their land for a variety of things. So it might be for food production, it might be for uh, integrating food and livestock, for market gardens, it might be uh, urban landscapes where people want edible backyards or integrating systems that include water catchment and energy and all kinds of different things. So we look at whole systems approach to design. And what permaculture does is it looks at it through an ethical lens. So we're looking at how do we, from an ethical foundation, move forward in a design approach for humans, for people. So we're thinking about how do we live large in a small footprint? How do we respect and honor the earth around us in a way that builds soil tilth and creates habitat diversity and uh, builds the skills within the human community to support that system? We find a lot of times in our design work these days that people want us to design pretty sophisticated systems, but then they don't have a skill base embedded in the community to actually manage those systems. Or they really want to grow food, but they don't have any experience harvesting food. So they'll put a lot of money and time and energy into getting a food system up and running, and then they'll go buy kale at the store rather than harvesting it in their yard because they don't know how to pick it. So there's a little disconnect in some of that stuff. So uh, we get to work on projects large and small. We work on everything from urban backyards to 220-acre sites to 60-acre farmsteads, uh, production gardens, and Patrick and I will be heading out in a few weeks to Belize to work with two contracts there. One is a 14,000-acre project, and the other one is a 40-acre Baptist ministry up in the hills that's converting an abandoned prison into a women's shelter. And they want to have food forests, and they want to have economy, and they want to have bio products and education programs. So we get to work on all kinds of projects, large and small, both here and abroad. It was pretty exciting. So um, I'll tell you about what we're doing with this project, and then later in the afternoon I have a 45-minute chunk of time to actually go much deeper into what we're doing. But I was asked to come out early in the summer to look at the whole 220-acre campus through a permaculture lens, and uh, trying to draw out from the people that are living, working here, what they really want on the land is uh, the first big important thing we have to do. What's the goals of the project? And so the goals were everything from contemplative interaction with the land that helps us connect with the divine within each of us through a nature frame. So how do we get out, how do we get drawn out into nature in a way that's going to allow us to really open our hearts and minds and souls to the beauty of nature around us? So that was one big goal. Um, another goal, they wanted to have a series of hermitages up in the woods so people could come and do long-term, maybe silent meditations or silent stays for up to three months at a time, where it would be very, very simple, rustic uh, cabins in the woods with very little interaction with other people, but walking the grounds and being in a very quiet, contemplative place. We wanted to have abundant, delicious, organic food grown for the cafeteria and humanely raised livestock. And of course we wanted to honor all the traditions and we wanted to restore the land back to its more, more of its full potential. This is a 100-year-old farm that hasn't really been farmed in many years. And the livestock that's here is not being really managed very well and they're also in a wetlands area. So we were looking at all the different pieces that would make this land really start to sing. So we've been up here many times walking the land and uh, taking notes and visiting all the sacred places and looking at the potential for what we could do here. So I'll very quickly go through what we came up with on the map. And this will be on display if you guys want to dig in deeper. So what we looked at is, this is the main lodge where we were, we were all just there. And we want to build a big viewing deck right off that upstairs. We would walk down the big viewing deck overlooking that hill that you see now would be a series of terraced vegetable and fruit gardens. There would be production gardens for the cafeteria, but with the paths wide enough so the guests could come and walk through that landscape and see the bounty being grown right there. This is a southwest facing knoll. It doesn't get any more perfect than that. So here we have the you know, terrace fruits and vegetables, and then we would enhance the wetlands right at the bottom. Right across the road, when you look out over that farm where the livestock is down below, is actually a confluence of three year-round streams that come down from different parts of the property. And it was, it used to be a wetlands, and somehow the farmers 100 years ago or more 
drained that wetland so that they could grow crops. And what we'd like to do is actually recreate this wetlands where it really wants to be anyway and put in a really beautiful, fertile, gorgeous wetland edge with the cattails and the ripping blackbirds and all the beautiful wildlife with the trail around and then a few small islands with a boardwalk connecting them through the wetlands with a little um, gathering space on some of the islands. And then we want to build into the wetlands a natural swimming pool. Has anybody ever seen a natural swimming pool design? A couple people, yeah. So it's a, it, rather than having a chlorine pool in a cement tank, you actually use a filtration system with the wetlands around it and you circulate the water out into the wetlands and then the biota and microbes in the wetlands actually filter the water. Mm. So it's just a gorgeous, beautiful way to have a swimming pool on site. <coughs> Um, walking down through here, we have the big ball fields where the students come and have their summer programming. And one thing we learned is that this facility is operating at 15% occupancy. So to really raise that occupancy level, we'll be working on a whole series of different types of programming, as well as honoring the program that they already have, but taking the programming they have and enhancing it in a much different way. So down in the ball fields, you may remember looking out, it looks pretty hot and dry over there because it's really hot and dry. If you're in summer football camp, it's about as hot and dry as it gets. So we want to surround the entire ball fields with snack fruits so that when you come off the soccer field, you can actually eat plums. And so there'll be fresh berries and snack fruits and nut groves all around the edge with a parkour all around the edge for anybody who wants to come and, and use that, the, the natural parkour. And these are all edible hedgerows up and down the roads. And then the trails would come across to a labyrinth that then would connect us to what we're calling the Pathways Through Spirituality, which is a series of groves of trees honoring different traditions. So we'd have olive groves and uh, oak groves and fig groves and Tulsi sacred basil groves. And then in each of these would be art and uh, things relating to those different traditions connected by arbors with kiwis and grapes. So you'd walk into an edible arboretum that would be an embrace of that sacred grove that would then connect you through a um, an arbor to the next one that would be an embrace of that. So it's kind of a series of outdoor classrooms or a series of places for people to gather that draw you across the side. Um, on the far end of the property, it's been really wet, you guys might not have had a chance to get out there, but way down on this end of the property is this absolutely stunning grove of very large cedars, so the sacred cedars, and so on this creek access that comes down to the, to the wetlands, we put in a medicine wheel, um, sweat lodge, and then an edible meadow over here of all native plants. So this weekend we can take trails to the edible meadow and then have this um, medicine wheel and sweat lodge on this side. Edible meadows all along this ridge line. And then coming up here we have the rotational grazing for the cows. It turns out that when cows are grazing on the land, they actually have a, an enzyme in the saliva that stimulates the growth of grass if they chew it down just this far. And if they move on, the plants grow really quickly and then their roots grow, sequestering carbon, gigantic roots into the system which is building soil tilth. If you let the animals stay in the land until they chew it all the way down to the nub, then the plants really can't regenerate very well. Nor are they going to build healthy root systems. And um, then their hooves are also on the ground, like tearing it up. So if you rotate the cattle every few days through a system, you have just these incredibly flourishing grasses coming up behind them. So we have swales on contour, which is a series of um, water holding uh, uh, swales that will grow perennial crops um, in between these rotational grazing, very fertile, fertile browns. And let's see, moving up into other places. Okay, so across from the chapel, there's this beautiful cirque. It's a bowl that sort of opens up. And we've put in there some uh, prayer wheels and a Shinto shrine. And then we want to plant trees in there that are all native bird attractors with certain types of berries on them, so that this whole cirque would be a singing bowl. Mm -hmm. So you could be in the singing bowl and hear the beautiful bird song around you and be in this quiet, contemplative, but very much vibrantly alive bird song bowl. Uh, what else have I got on here? We have um, up in the lodge where Will and Cynthia's house is, where one of the dormitories is, we have the St. Francis Gardens. And next to that is the Kuan Yin Peaceful Waters. There's a beautiful trail that goes through the creek that comes down. It's a little um, quiet shrine. But also, you know, the Kuan Yin is the Bodhisattva and the San Fran St. Francis, who's the connector to the, the animals and the divine and the animals. 
And then I have the Wu Wei Pass. And this is like all these little quotes on here. This is one of my favorite ones. It says, in the middle way, those who seek knowledge collect something every day. Those who seek the way let go of something every day. <laughs> and as a knowledge collector, I thought, oh, I have a lot to learn. So, um, so I put little quotes in for each of the areas. And the, the goal, what I, what I noticed about the land is this, this is a very beautiful piece of property but it's an indoor property. Even though there's this giant 220 acres to explore, you go to a building, you come inside, you have your conference, and there's really, there really aren't that many destinations that are gonna pull you out into the beauty that the land has to offer. So what I've tried to do is find the heart center of the land that will pull people into the heart center in a place of beauty, in a place of nature, as well as pull people out to the edges of the land in a way that lets us honor the sacred places that this land is offerings. So the heart center is this wetlands. So coming down out of the lodge, coming down out of the dormitories, the trails connecting us to this heart center of vibrant water, life, traditions, um, activities, things to do, places to go. Even in that pouring down rainstorm, I would have loved to be in this gazebo on this island, sitting there by the wetlands, right? And that's, a, that's an opportunity to be outdoors in nature. But then also, if you want to go exploring on the trails that you'll come across, this shrine in the cedars of Kuan Yin. And you'll come across the Sinian Bowl. And if you're up here, and they also put in a primitive skills area. So some of the programming we think of attracting here are, of course, in different peoples from around the world to honor um, their different traditions, but also for all the local programming that's going to be youth programming and adult education, and how do we attract people to come stay here for two, four, six, twelve you know, days at a time, where they're gonna be learning and applying their knowledge and would be able to walk away from this place inspired to go replicate this at home. For me in the permaculture world, it's not so much the incredible theory and philosophy that permaculture has to offer, because it's quite a stunning body of knowledge. But it's really, it's time to get busy, it's time to apply that knowledge and it's time to implement that knowledge so that we can start to live large on that small footprint. And we can be solution-based people. So this is a great opportunity and we're excited, it's been really fun to work on this project. In the breakout session later today, we'll be going into depth on how to implement this and what it would take to pull this together as a project. It would probably take us easily six months to do a whole comprehensive site master plan. And um, then we're looking at programming to dovetail with the implementation of this over time. Here we go, it's only 15 minutes. So I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, this, this is very exciting, but I'm also wanting to know more about permaculture just in terms of my own home. Are there any resources or books you suggest for smaller scale, like residential permaculture? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, uh, there's Gaia's Garden, okay. which is a really great one, and actually Introduction to Permaculture. Okay. They're both about 25 bucks, just you know, they're about this big paperbacks, and they have lots of graphics and charts, and really easy to cool. read explanations of how to get going and stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really wonderful to hear what you're saying. I, um, I have a center on the East Coast, and we're working on a plan. I'm really curious how long it took you to get to this point, and how, um, what the scope of this is. Like, I'm not really looking for dollars exactly, but how many years, and how, in broad numbers, what do you think the investment is going to take to make some of this come to fruition? Um. It'll probably be about seventy-five to $80,000 to do a really comprehensive site master plan. That's like a 70-page, you know, super detailed explanation, soil tests, uh, really thorough look at how to do that. And, and this, is, this is a conceptual plan of where my first best guess in a really short amount of time is going to allow us to go. The implementation part of it can easily be put in a programming modality. So if we're going to build out gazebos, we could have gazebo building workshop at the Camp Brotherhood and you know, delicious food and you know, we, we could put it into programming um, pretty, pretty easily. The wetlands, this is an earthworks project that's going to need to really to do this well. And I don't know, I had, that's part of the master plan is finding out the answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. So what we do in a master plan is we help prioritize which things feel like the most important. And then we look at how do we chip away at that and what's going to be a leverage point, for example, what one thing of this would really attract more programming here? 
my gut feeling is the food, right? I mean, so like if we had a, a fabulous <coughs> chef and really delicious natural organic food coming from the land, you would have people already, you know, this would, this would land on their map pretty well. Um, to have the wetlands in and start to develop these food forests around the edges, you know, the, the mainframe infrastructure part really has to come first. Uh, these are pretty easy, you know, putting in the hermitages, you know, whacking trails through the woods and building really simple cabins with tiny little wood stoves in them. They're very austere, and I don't think of them as having much fluff in them, you know, so those, those would be pretty straightforward. And, um, but in terms of a, thinking of fundraising, and you could probably fundraise for the St. Francis Gardens, a statuary that's a design for that garden that's going to take this whole field up here and around these buildings and really look at, you know, very, uh, turning down that rheostat very finely in terms of what it would take to implement that garden. Mm -hmm. One of the exciting things for me is being on the board is um, a thing that's big in our schools is outdoor education. Mm -hmm. And exact, I mean, this would just be incredible. Absolutely. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. In uh, yeah. our area here for sure. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, this island wood over in Bainbridge Island, they have a really beautiful campus. They have narrowed their focus so that they're fourth, fifth, and sixth grade environmental education. People throw money at them. Because who doesn't want to support fourth, fifth, and sixth grade environmental ed? And the kids come for two or three or four days at a time, and they live on site, and they get to you know walk around and experience nature. I think that you know for youth and for adult education, having a campus where you can go out and be in nature with the diversity that this design offers is pretty stunning. And I think for the ball fields, why don't all ball fields have snack fruits around them? I mean, I don't get it. So like you know, the idea that you could walk off and you know and eat different fruits and walk down through these edible hedgerows and be munching berries all the time. And sit in the shade. And sit in the shade, right? And you know, be under the tree. And the nut groves, nut trees take, you know, eight, nine, ten years to bear. But once they start to bear, they bear prolifically, right? And tons and tons and tons of nuts, tonnages of nuts. One mature chestnut tree will give you 240 gallons of nuts, you know, just pretty stunning protein, oil, like all these things we're missing in the local diet here. So we're, we're trying to look at this campus through several different lenses at once. But the real big one is helping people to connect to their own personal divine through nature. And so what is that wellspring and joy that comes from being out in nature? And how can we through art and through design and through uh, the middle way, walking down paths, we're reminded all the time of these different traditions and then being able to sit with that in quiet places. But just very briefly, so here are my goals. Inspiration, beauty, places to be outside in confrontation, areas to congregate in various sized groups, honor different traditions, and then the sacred groves, of course. But we really want to invite the guests to explore and experience the land via a series of groves, gardens, overlooks, and nature-rich landscapes that honor the divine in every step. And I'll go into more detail. But thanks for listening, and I hope to see you guys later this afternoon. And it's kind of fun to get up close and look at the details and sort of what, what we're trying to um, let the land speak to us and in a way that we can then connect with the land.